Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you'd find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I would love for you to give me a follow. Oh yeah, this is me. <laughs> This is my very first show, and I have something a little different planned. I asked my lifelong friend if she would join me today for a reverse interview. Say hi, Jessica. Hi. <laughs> also, Jessica, what pronouns do you want to use I'm show? she, her. She, her. Yeah. Okay. So she is going to be interviewing me about what my last year has looked like as I've journeyed towards getting my somatic sex educator certificate. We have known each other since we were kids growing up, and recently she shared that she had noticed some big shifts in my life, in my soul, and my healing journey. I felt this would be the perfect interviewer to learn more about what I've experienced and spread the word about what I have been up to. So this is the space in which we sit, and so let's just acknowledge that. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, play, and are recording this episode on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Gaina, the Pikani, as well as the Sutina uh, Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nation, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Beautifully said. Thanks, Jessica. And every episode, I also wanted to start off with offering a somatic inquiry. This is something that I've learned in my class. And whenever we get on Zoom and have any sort of class or discussion, um, we usually start with one of these just to get embodied. And I think it would be nice for Jessica and me to do this. Okay, so this one is called The Laugh Be Lion Breath. And it's actually kind of fun. So what I'm going to invite you to do, if you're listening, I'm going to invite this to Jessica and myself too, we're going to participate in this, is just to take a deep breath and then on your exhale, laugh. Okay. And then another (laughs) deep breath and then on your exhale, make a buzzing sound like a bee would. And then another deep breath and then on your exhale, roar like a lion. And it just kind of helps your nervous system really like become a little bit more aligned so that sounds good maybe so just sit comfortably notice the chair underneath of you if you're sitting in a chair if you're laying on the ground whatever is supporting you right now on mother earth and just when you're ready take a deep breath in and laugh (laughs) (laughs) we're like looking at each other (laughs) <laughs> oh, feels good. And then mm-hmm. another breath. Bzzz. And baritone B. <laughs> and one more breath. <laughs> I probably could have done that louder, but then I would have blown the speaker. I know. I was looking at the, I'm like, are we going in the red? I should have turned. That felt good. It's like very childlike. Yeah. You can feel your body taking a notch down. Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel a little bit more aligned with myself. Definitely. Anything else that you're noticing from it? Um, Tingleys. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's because I was trying to hold my breath and wait, but also... I've seen it too with kids where they scream as they're running across a field ah. and it helps them to regulate. So, yeah. It's I, I feel like I need to powerful. do that. <laughs> Run through a field screaming. It's sometimes. probably the same effect as yelling into a pillow, except that you're doing it for joy <laughs> and not a release. <laughs> yeah. So, because people usually associate that with like negative yeah. emotions. Yeah. Instead of just regulation of your everyday yeah. moods. Yeah. 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 Like cool. recess. That's what I thought of with kids. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Freedom. Uh, okay. okay. So, so I don't, I don't know, Jessica, is there anything that you want to share with anybody that's listening right now? 
Yeah, actually, so I've known Tara for a really long time, but this is the first time that I have had the opportunity to actually talk with you about this stuff. Um, when I try to explain it to others, I don't really know what to say. I don't know how to explain it. And in the world that we're living in, it's hard to, I want to say, find the words to make it as educational as possible mm -hmm. without the stigmas. Yes. around it yeah and that's the most important part that's one of the reasons why I said yes let's do this because <laughs> I want to learn more and I know that so many other people benefit from it too amazing um so and I just want to say too this is the first time that I've ever interviewed somebody who's not in like a non-monogamous yeah. relationship yeah and I learn a lot. For, I learn a lot from you from my for my monogamous monogamous relationship because there's benefits to everyone. Right? Yeah. There's benefits to to all, and so you just got to kind of pick and pick which parts apply to you. So I'm yeah. definitely going to learn something today for and, sure. And with my work, I don't want it to just be for non monogamous yeah. folks. I want it to be accessible for people who are in established relationships that are monogamous and. Yeah, so I I thought this would be a good fit for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I and because we've known each other yeah. for forever. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so going with that, um, let's just start getting right into what does somatic mean? What does that what does that word mean? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great way to start. Um, so somatics comes from the Greek word soma. And it's basically like the best word that English speaking people have come up with to just understand the human body as a whole. Um, and that's basically kind of what it means is like the body. Soma is right. the body. Um, and really what somatics do is it integrates the mind, the body, and the spirit. Uh, like in traditional therapy if you go see like a therapist just psychologists um anybody like that it's they're working from the head down right so they yeah. they have you think about things and like oh if you could cho change this then this might happen or you know offering um offering different ways to think and sometimes that's not easy for people because it's valuing one form higher than another yeah definitely and really like you need to integrate all three things right. to really see big changes like understanding what's coming up in your body how your right. body's responding to things feeling your body becoming connected to your body again right. and that's kind of what somatics introduces is this other missing piece right. that you're you're thinking with the body up right? You're okay. feeling through the body up and, and learning how to read that yourself. And exactly. Yeah. And understanding these things. Um, and so like one thing I wrote down here is like, it's the understanding that people are not mind over matter. If I think differently, I will be different. And it's not mind over spirit. So if you're taking meds, for example, like for anxiety or bipolar, it's that change in chemistry or medication doesn't wholly change your experience. It just changes the, the chemistry in your body. Right. So rather, we're all these things combined. We're emotional, we're conceptual, we're biological, and we're spiritual. And it's kind of taking all of those things and putting the pieces together to understand yourself a little bit more and your reaction and your feelings and your emotions that's in the world that you live in. Right. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything else I want to add on that? Let me think. Um, yeah, perhaps just the most unique thing about somatics is it integrates the body from the neck down. So we're not using our brain all the time to think about things. It's like me, like after we did the the breathing exercise, I'm like, what are you noticing? And right. you, you discuss like, oh, I feel tingling. tingling. Right. That's exactly what it is, right? right? Like it's these things. Tuning in to those parts that normally you would just think about, but now you need to recognize and start to understand what they mean exactly. to your body. Yeah. Uh, kind of the same thing with like feeling stress can not only, or like, or feeling something within your body. Normally we feel that, um, 
maybe a little bit higher up with our racing minds, but maybe we also start to feel it in our gut or we feel it in our, you know, our legs and we might feel pain that we don't realize where it's coming from. Some people will say, I don't feel stressed at all. No, no, I'm not stressed. I'm great. I'm happy. But we might feel it more in our body than we realize. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And this is like the the story of myself. Right. Which leads into the next, why did you become a sex or a somatic sex educator? Yeah. Like it's, I saw so many psychologists and therapists over the years. I have a lot of childhood wounds, childhood trauma, sexual trauma. And like they touched the surface. It felt good to go and talk to somebody. But I feel like, like you said, like there is anxiety. There is a layer of anxiety and stress and I, I didn't even know how to recognize it. You didn't realize it was a result. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Or a symptom. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I just had all of these health issues keep coming up. And my doctor's like, you're fine. Like, we're running these tests and your blood work is great. Your heart rate is great. Your blood pressure is okay. Like, we don't really know what's what's going on and why you're feeling this. And so I went to a naturopath and... You know, she's trying to help me with holistic health. And she's like, you know, I have this somatic therapist. She's a somatic social worker. She wasn't a somatic sex educator who I think you might benefit from. So I started seeing her um, during COVID. It was July right. 2020. Yeah, I remember. And like the very first thing that we do going into the room, she's like, where do you want to sit? And there's all these options. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, this is so too much weird. choice. <laughs> like she's like okay well sit here and like what are you noticing and then where do you want me to sit sit here I can sit here or I'm like I don't know in front of me like this is so bizarre to to me yeah Yeah. Yeah. and she's like no this is about you right and what makes you feel comfortable I'm like oh my god this is so weird which can also be a very uncomfortable feeling to voice what you need voice and choice yeah which is somatics is all about voice and choice but yeah and a huge layer of that and we worked through a lot of stuff in just noticing my body and really just slowing the fuck down I remember you coming out of that very first meeting with her and I remember you saying Jessica I it's it's like changed the way I'm thinking about things Mm -hmm. has changed like I've never experienced something like that before yeah, I it was very profound. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And I saw her for quite a while. And then uh, with all of these changes from COVID and ending sex uninterrupted, which you know about, yeah. um, kind of retiring that show and that part of my life, that was a huge part of my life. I didn't know where to go next. Yeah. And I had had my eye on the Institute for the Study for Somatic Sex Education for a while because... I felt it was important to expand my knowledge at some point. Like this is like years and years ago that I had Mm -hmm. my eye on it. And so I looked into it again and I'm like, you know what? I think this is, this is the right time for Mm -hmm. me to enroll. And it's scary because it's not like I have a stable job at the moment, but at the same time, that gave me a lot of time yeah. to invest into learning. Yeah, and almost accelerate that learning at a pace that worked for your goals. Yes, yeah. yeah. And so I enrolled. I made the plunge. I'm like, okay, I'm going to enroll in their their first course. And wow, like it, it just blew my mind, everything that I was learning about intimacy, sex, gender, oppression, consent. white privilege, consent. Yeah. It, I'm like, this is where I, I have wanted to be for a long time in my life. And I'm still very grateful about having sex uninterrupted. Everything I learned from the lifestyle and being in the swinger community, because that really ex- was able to accelerate yeah. my learning. Yeah. It's a, it's a platform. Yeah. Right? It yeah. totally helped with that. Everything you did there led you to where you are now. It, yeah, it, yeah. Like the building blocks fit perfectly on top of each other with that. Yeah, that's good. That's awesome. Um, so what kinds of things do you help people um, learn with being a somatic sex educator? Whew. I mean, there's so many 
levels to this and there's so many i'm going to refer to it as sse somatic sex educators that's okay. kind of what i'll we try use. to remember that acronym <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to but <laughs> if you hear me say it that's what it means mm-hmm. um yeah like so many sses offer different things um there's people who exclusively help with people working through gender and like somatically understanding their gender whether they're non-binary non-gender conforming um trans the trans community like that's a big part of it because being embodied that's a level that is needed to really understand how you're feeling about your gender and your gender expression Mm -hmm. and how people perceive you as well um so that's one part of it there's people who work exclusively as sexological body workers so they do lots of hands-on work and that's hands-on hands in (laughs) yeah um and working with people who have experienced sexual trauma uh learning choice and voice for their body how to advocate for themselves how to um learn not to people please especially when it comes to the bedroom because a lot of times for people pleasers in our everyday life, we're going to be people pleasers in the bedroom with our right. partners or and lovers. not listening to ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like just letting other people take over. Um, people help with non-monogamous relationships. If there's like a difference in, in sex drive, uh, I really hate using the word sex drive, but if, if one partner wants something different than another partner, how do we work through that? Uh, even people who might not have orgasmed ever in their life, like, right. uh, or different ways of looking how to orgasm or masturbate, um, people who have experienced maybe cultural or religion, um, what's the word? Oppression. Oppression yeah. And they're struggling with how to just reconnect or even connect with their sexuality. Right. Acknowledge it. Yeah. So there's so like people who might experience we SSEs don't like using the term sexual dysfunctions, but how to navigate if you have premature ejaculation mm-hmm. or erectile dysfunction, uh, if you have pain during sex. Um, yeah, it's just there's so many different ways that yeah, SSEs Yeah, I didn't even help. realize that. Like, that's a wide range yes. uh, of specialties and um, different people that you can be helping depending on what they need. Yeah. 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 That's a lot. And a lot of times an SSE will, um, they'll figure out kind of what their niche is or have a few different niches that they're in. I'm still kind of trying to figure out what I like. Personally, I really enjoy working with couples. Yeah. uh, And that's been kind of my work, even with non-monogamous folks in the past. But really just helping couples and individuals in relationships expand the pleasure that's possible in their relationship or relationships with others. Okay. Do you have another question before we might jump into a little bit of a break? No, I think we can take a break. Okay. Awesome. So sit tight and we will be back soon. Welcome back to Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I am here with Jessica, and she is interviewing me. Yay yeah. for reverse interviews. Yeah, I'm learning, <laughs> I'm learning so much. Um, we were talking off the record. We were having and we're a lot like, of conversations. We have Stop to pause talking. this. <laughs> yeah. We have to bring this into yeah. the next segment. So we were just talking about how, you know, sometimes this role, this SSE role that you are playing in people's lives can be misinterpreted um, as something that it's not. And so you had told me the history of where the somatic sex education comes from and and where it kind of started and where it was recognized that um, this role can help people. So do you want to go further (laughs) into that? Yeah, the sacred whores um, way, way back uh, when there was brothels. You know, these were the people that majority men would go to, sometimes even couples and women, uh, to help heal these aspects of themselves with with the sacred horrors, with the prostitutes. And Mm -hmm. so there is a level of sex work that is part of being a somatic sex educator because we are touching people um, 
and in some cases, it's two-way touch. There Today, there is people who are surrogates um, and they have clients and there is two-way touch. And they're trying to help people navigate their sexuality, their ability to be in relationships and, and with it others in a way. and practice it in a healthy yeah. way using choice, voice, client-directed kind of modalities right it's uh yeah it's kind of a interesting thing and really where somatic sex education was birthed was with a man named joseph kramer in the 70s 80s 90s and he was uh, a gay man and he was very like during the aids pandemic nobody touched these gay men and so he helped design almost this curriculum to help offer a touch to these men once again and to help the healing of the trauma that they endured you know during the AIDS pandemic there was a woman that came on with him and so she offered it for women um kind of like the equivalent of it uh and then it's kind of been birthed into to you know using the less gendered right right being opening it up to all communities and everyone yeah you know and being very conscious of privilege and oppression and you know like white people were both white white presenting uh you know like it's a lot easier for us to access healing and uh access just about anything you know rather than people who are racial racially discriminated Mm -hmm. and oppressed and um you know a lot of times those people also experience a lot of even fetishization and i see that in you know the swinger community quite predominantly yeah so yeah that's kind of where it was birthed and the institute that i'm with that i'm studying with they have done a fantastic job of just introducing this these new ideologies um very i i want to say say like forward thinking modern ways of thinking you know like i didn't know so all of this about oppression and white privilege and gender and even (laughs) you have been educating me when you know you try to I, I in in your social media stuff you know <laughs> you share a lot of the stuff that you have learned um and i'm learning every day and then you'll come out of a class and you'll teach me even more <laughs> that i didn't know and then i'm teaching others like there's always new stuff to learn yeah so that kind of brings um us into this next question that a lot of people are jumping into this career mm-hmm. and what is your favorite course so far Ooh. through this this whole experience oh <sighs> well I just actually completed my third core course which was huge amount of work it was very heavy yeah. coursework and so the first course was it's all online self-guided yeah. the second one was in person it's an intensive it was 10 days long but because of COVID we did it all through Zoom right and then this third one again was self-directed uh and it was quite a lot of work. The two that really stood out to me the, was um, being trauma-informed, having a trauma-informed practice. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, the stories that I watched, the videos of, like, people and what they experienced and how to, how to be a trauma-informed practitioner, I was wowed by it. There's so much good information and really just – stuff that I wish I had known before when I was coaching people right. like looking back I'm like ooh, I, that wasn't maybe the most appropriate way to address yeah that I was like wow them, yeah. okay this is really helpful and I feel like anybody who's doing sex coaching should be trauma informed and like right. have some of that knowledge under their belt and can you um just explain like maybe I, I'm, th- I'm throwing this in there on you I uh, like an example of the way you might switch your approach versus what you would have done. Like, what did that teach you? Ooh, okay. Well, one thing that I learned that was really wowed me, uh, and this was in my consent workshop that I did. I did an eight-week consent, like a pro training. Um, 
so we discuss like domains and boundaries and choice and voice and basically every person has their own little domain that's kind of your boundary that's what you have a right to and a responsibility to so in a relationship there's two different ones if there's two people in your relationship and let's say one person is like I want like a threesome or I want to try anal or I want a blowjob even um instead of asking for that they might like go into the other person's domain oh. and try to get them right to to want that and so previously in my coaching this is something I can't believe I did um somebody's like I'm interested in a monogamous relationship and I'm like well maybe you know, wake up one morning and tell your partner, oh, I had this really sexy dream of a threesome with another person. It was hot. What do you think about that? Mm. Right? Yeah. It's kind of like a little white lie. I'm like, oh, there's no harm in that. And then so I learn in this course that that's called desire smuggling. Okay. Instead of advocating for yourself and saying, hey, you know, I... This is what I want. I'm I've been really that, thinking yeah. about this, right? It's almost like subliminal messaging. <laughs> And I'm like, I can't fucking believe I used to do that. Like, so there's a lot I've learned. That's good that you recognize, though, yeah. right? Past um, things that you Past did. Past harm. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That you now can recognize and change. And you have those to pull from when you have that come up again. Yeah, yeah. And then um, in this core course three that I took, there's this woman named Stacy Haynes. And she does a lot of fantastic work of like somatically helping people to um, have a sense of safety. Uh, and so like there's how to say no and what a no feels like in your body, what a yes feels like in your body, what a maybe feels like. And there's a ton of somatic exercises that we learned that we can do with clients to help assess where they are too right. before we even start working um, with them. And then the second unit that I found really fascinating was uh, that it was like all about the anus. And <laughs> I know, Jessica's laughing. <laughs> oh, yes. I I'm remember. Because <laughs> I told you all about yes. this. I'm like, oh, my God, this was such profound healing for me. Um, and even with the volunteer that I had the opportunity to work on, um, it was a cisgendered male. And... Like, they went into a trance during it. And, you know, at first I was a little bit concerned. I'm like, oh, my God, is this okay? Like, how can they self-advocate for themselves? I was doing the check-in. They were responding. But afterwards, they did barely even remembered any of it. Oh, weird. And so I checked in with my faculty like, mentor. I'm like, ooh, yeah. did I, like, cross a boundary? And they're like, it's pretty common when you're doing anal work to get into these trance, like, modes with your body because it's so incredibly healing and you're exploring and opening up these different parts of you that typically are associated with a lot of shame right and you close it or off. pain yeah and um so just make sure when you're with your client that you have this discussion beforehand um to, like let them know that this could be a possibility and what should i do what do you want me to do if, right if i if realize that happens yeah yeah so it was, it was an eye opener for me. I was like, an eye opener, huh? But yeah, <laughs> it was pretty intense. Okay. So that sounds kind of like one of your wow moments, but are there any other wow moments that you've had throughout your experiences? I think like doing the, the intensive in person with other peers and the faculty mentors was like, I've never been in a situation like that to be so vulnerable and explore my body and witness the exploration of people going through what they're learning about in their bodies too. Right. And I think that's really, really important for people to know that might reach out um, for your help is that you have experienced these things yes. too. You have gone through it all. You're not just doing it from a textbook. Yeah. You have immersed yourself in these healing practices Physically. Yes, physically. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and emotionally and psychologically. Sexually. Like you have immersed yourself fully to know what it feels like. And I think that's where where you were like, oh, I've noticed a big change in you. Yeah. Like, I think that's where it stems from is right. just like the amount of people pleasing I used to do two, three, four years ago, my whole life 
I, I'm like, I, there's no way that that's fitting into my life anymore. Right. I'm able to like self advocate, um, notice, trust, value, and communicate what my needs, my desires, my boundaries, my limits are. And that's probably one of the biggest gifts that I've taken yeah. so far from learning. And everything. it probably has taken a lot of stress off of you. Yes. To just yeah. Let that go and set those boundaries. Like light, I feel lighter. Mm -hmm. I feel more aligned with who I am as as Tara. You yeah. know, it's, yeah, it's been an incredible journey. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So that we've already checked off that next question. <laughs> Has it changed anything for you in your personal life? Yes. Check. Yes. Uh, anything else you want to add to that one? Let me think. What about like James and you? Yeah, definitely. I think like our whole, I mean, our whole sex life changed a lot when mm -hmm. it came to COVID uh and really taking a, a step back from like the swinger community um you know before covid i kind of had just like things were rubbing me the wrong way i'm like i don't like this i don't like i don't like people 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 pleasing i don't like people not using their voices i don't right. enjoy how much in <laughs> how many drugs and alcohol is are being consumed and how does that work when you're bringing sex in there and how do they consent and mm -hmm. like there are so many layers that were happening in my brain that you already were considering before you got to these courses even before yeah. covid yeah and then when covid hit it was like hey i need to take a step back uh and it, like our whole relationship has been built on non-monogamy right. so this was really interesting to like yeah navigate for the first time ever yeah a monogamous relationship mm -hmm. right and so i think everything that i've learned through through school through my classes through these inquiries through my experiences i've tried to bring into the bedroom and james has been extremely open to trying this stuff you know i'm very lucky to have a supportive partner in this um, there's a lot of SSEs who are in partnerships before starting this work and it, it shifts so much that they, they just can't be in those partnerships. It, yeah. yeah. It's just, there's too much. Well, it would change. It takes, it continues on with the communication that you had before with James continuing that on now with your work, right? Yes, yeah. it is work, but it is still work that you have to communicate with each other yeah and still continue to keep that safe container with you guys yes oh yeah. my god absolutely and yeah it's been it's been a roller coaster it's not easy yeah like it's definitely yeah. had its challenges um but we I think we as individuals and even as couples because he's been my volunteer for a lot of stuff mm -hmm. on on the, on my assignments um but I think he's you know, he's so open to like learning more about gender and like he's it's it's just fascinating to me like how open he is to that and learning more and understanding more about just how what's that word oppressing a society can be how the patriarchy yeah. can be yeah. how capitalism can be and he's so open to that you know as a cisgendered male who's, right. who's hetero flexible is what he likes to say yeah it's that's not something that is easy to remove those shackles that right. you've learned your whole life yeah it's been pretty incredible to witness and and be with him on that journey yeah that's awesome it's really good that he is so supportive and open to taking that journey with you wherever it takes you mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome yeah yes. um so let's talk about one of your educate educated talents sexological bodywork did i mm -hmm. say that right yeah sexological sexological all right so what is that what is that's the hands-on work okay. that and is that your what you think you're kind of moving into with couples or is that just a layer of it that we were, we're talking about. I I feel like it's going to be a layer of it, you know, um, to get somebody on the table, yeah. <laughs> like a massage table, 
or wherever. So, I mean, there's SSEs, there's yeah. there's floor setups. There's so many beautiful setups that I've seen um, fellow peers and uh, fellow peers set up. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's like hands-on work. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the assignments that I've done in Core Course 3 have been based on the curriculum for sexological body work because uh, there's two associations. There's that and the association for somatic sex educators and once i graduate i can be a part of both of those oh, okay. because i've taken both curriculums um but yeah it's like hands-on work so there was one assignment about scar tissue and helping re remediation for scar tissue so like people who go through childbirth and have right. traumatic childbirth experiences or scars right helping them with that um, pelvic floor stuff pelvic floor yeah. <laughs> yeah. um people with penises who are circumcised you know oftentimes that is a very traumatic and, yeah. experience for an infant to go through and like a lot of times it's it can cause a lot of uh issues as like you get nerve, older nerve damage and stuff. sensation yeah. issues yeah. nerve damage uh shrinkage of the penis uh so that was one of the assignments that I did was helping somebody who's circumcised um, work through that scar okay. remediation. And there's like all these different techniques that you can use and that they can learn and do themselves as okay. well. Um, even, you know, people who have been through top surgery, so had their breasts removed, people who have gotten their breasts enlarged, there's scar tissue there. Uh, sometimes they lose feeling. So, um like using castor oil and, you know, doing certain rolling. I'm like doing it right now. Yeah, just the hand see. motions. Yeah, like um, <laughs> working through their scar tissue with that. And that's just like one one aspect of it. Right. Uh, there's so many different, so many different aspects that sexological body work can be, can be utilized. Right. And, and helping people connect with their body and healing their body. Okay. So not only you're hands on, but it teaching them to help themselves be hands on with their own body. Yeah, yeah, like masturbation coaching. Yeah, <laughs> it's yes. like one of them too. You told me a lot about that too. <laughs> Mindful erotic practice, yeah. like yeah, uh, there's um, static erotic massages where we're integrating um, genital touch and these breathing exercises where people can experience, you know, not just genital orgasms, but full body orgasms where you're bringing the orgasm up from your pelvis and to your heart and literally people shaking on the table. Like, I don't know if you've seen um, Sex Love Goop with Gwyneth Paltrow. It's on Netflix. Okay, no, I haven't. There's some segments that really can show people, like you can witness what sexological body work can be like yeah. now mind you it is you know hollywood there they skipped a lot of like what the choice in voice and boundary work is okay. that goes in before right. somebody's being touched on the table right because it's not just one session no this is sessions session, on sessions, sessions building that trust that trust yeah. that you know communication that um being able to feel your body first of all yeah there's tons of assessments that we do as practitioners First of all, to make sure that somebody's even, you know, ready to right. be touched in that way. Right. Yeah. I was just thinking there's something that came to mind. I remember that I watched, I don't know where it was, but it was on some streaming platform and it was about like tantric massages and other things. Um, and that just kind of brought that thought of that whole body experience, except that this is a healing practice. Um not necessarily a pleasure side where you're just going to experience a pleasure you're going to heal so you can experience that pleasure and yeah. identify that within your body um so there's more layers to it than just a tantric massage yes yes <laughs> yeah yeah and there is like it is a little bit different yeah um we do offer like those ecstatic erotic massages we can offer that but there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle that are going right. to be in place before we can even get to that point. yeah like yeah. trust ourselves trust our clients yeah. you know yeah definitely so there you mentioned that 
this is um, something you work with your clients to help them um, identify these things in themselves, learn how to help themselves and heal themselves as well as with your help. But how can we incorporate this into our lives? So this somatic sex education, like how can we incorporate this kind of stuff? (laughs) How can we incorporate it? Um, You know, I think one really good tool that I learned just when I was with my somatic therapist is um, just checking in, like doing check-ins with your body and doing like a body scan, um, like setting a timer on your phone. And like, this is just one little thing that I can offer people. But you know, when this little chime or timer goes off, um, pause, whatever you're doing, you might be sitting in front of your computer, you might be in the office, you might be um, you know, s- watching your kids, whatever it is, but just like check in with your body, like take a few deep breaths and, you know, where, where in your body do you feel really good right now? Right. And just focus on that good feeling or what's coming up. Maybe you don't have somewhere in your body that you're not feeling good at the moment. Um, what is, what does that feel like? And <clears throat> looking for words, to to just describe that instead of like I feel good right you know no like what sensations are you noticing in right. your body Where right are now they happening? oh I feel like my stomach is like really open right now or I feel like my legs or I feel like I have like a tingling or a vibrating in my legs right now just slowly start introducing what your body is experiencing somatically into your life and that's just like one little timbit but taking that time to just pause every a few times a day you know and just like a little mindfulness check and that does not have to relate to sex no exactly it's it's just tuning into what your body's telling you Mm -hmm. like even on my drive here I was like blaring my I heard you pull up (laughs) (laughs) and and I had the music so loud and it wasn't until I turned it off that I realized my heart was racing because <laughs> this is the first podcast I've ever done ever. And I was like, oh, I'm nervous. But I was trying to block it out with the music. And then mm-hmm. when I turned it off, I was like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We do that a lot in our yeah. culture. <laughs> yes. Let's, let's just block it let's out. Let's just dissociate from yeah. it. <laughs> um, yeah. So that helps to become a little bit more embodied somatically. Um, and I think just like really noticing what your body is telling you when you taking that sacred pause. So if somebody asks you to do something, whether it be at work, in your relationship, your children, even your parents, take that sacred pause, <sighs> yeah. breathe. And just ask yourself, do I want to do this? Am I willing to do this? Can I give it with a full heart? Do I want to do it? Am I willing? Can I do it with a full heart? And, you know, like, be honest with yourself and just start setting those boundaries, understanding what your limits feel like and determining, you know, what what a a big hell yeah feels like versus fuck I don't want to fucking do this so how how do we recognize like so I don't know if you have because everyone will feel different depending on those Mm -hmm. but how do we recognize like a subtle no like I'm leaning towards a bit of a no but I want to say yes because I want to please or because I'm I'm a yes gal and I always say yes but I don't want to actually say yes like how do we recognize that in our bodies what would our bodies Hmm. a common thing obviously it's not the same for everybody but okay I have a a little practice I can offer okay are you willing to be my volunteer for sure sure (laughs) okay so I'm gonna offer some invitations yeah and every one of them I want you to say no okay to okay Jessica will you braid my hair for me no Jessica, will you go for a walk with our dogs together? No. Jessica, will you come and stay for a week with my animals so I can go on vacation? No. (laughs) May I dress you up in some of my sexy clothes? No. Okay. So did you notice your different nose there? Yes. Very much so. Some of them made me want to cry. (laughs) 
<laughs> I got saying no to something I would genuinely want to do pulled out an emotional I could see it yeah I could see your when when I was like can I dress you up in my sexy clothes you're like no <laughs> yeah that that one I was like maybe <laughs> oh really okay in my mind no but that was an easier no than the other ones because the other ones are from our friendship connection to say no to something like that when it's so easy for me to be able to say yes. Genuinely, I would want to say yes, absolutely. So if I was to say like, Jessica, will you come and clean my entire house for two days? No. And what did that no feel like? Easy. There. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Unless you were to change the way that you asked, right? And I think that that's the whole consent thing too, that sometimes people can ask things in a way that makes you feel bad to say what you truly want to say. If they word it, if yeah. they, you know, if you were to say, can you just come clean my house for two days? It's easy for me to say no mm. and to stick true to my values or what I want, my needs. But if you were to say... I really need your help. I'm drowning in all of this work. Can you come help me for two days? That's an enti- That evokes an emotion, right? An emotional response. And so sometimes being able to understand and still stick to your, your grounds to say, no, you know what? I can't. For myself, I can't do that. And that's important part of your work, right? Is getting, getting your clients to recognize that it's okay to still say no, even if the other person really wants you to say yes and is trying to get you to say yes and it's not your responsibility to tend to their Their emotions yeah Yeah. if you say no yeah that's for them to tend to yeah and that's for them to do that work yeah and there was something I was going to say um oh there is also like a difference between wanting to do something and willing to do something too right you know and when I don't want to get too off topic with all of this, but one way to always look at it is and, and to approach like boundaries and consent and requests and invitations is who is doing the action. So if you Who's come over to my it? house yeah. to clean my house, you're doing that action. You're giving me the gift, mm-hmm. right? That's typically how where we learn about gift giving and giving and receiving and all of that. But for me to dress you up in some sexy clothes, you're still giving me that gift, but I'm doing the action. Uh Okay. Right? So there's two different ways to approach it. But at the end of the day, it's still both for me. You're still giving me a gift, even though you're not doing anything. You're just giving me access to your body. Right. And it's, it can be, this can be transferred into, you know, sexually too yeah let's say as let's say i don't like people going down on me and giving me oral sex right it's not something that like does anything for me i don't it's not enjoyable it's not super pleasurable but let's say my partner really enjoys giving Giving yeah oral sex i might give the gift of access to my body for him or her to do that or they or whoever to do that to my body because I'm, I'm, I still am willing to give that gift, mm-hmm. but it's not for me. Right. It's for them. Yeah. Even though I'm receiving yes. ish, I'm putting in quotation marks, receiving that, it's, they're still receiving the actual gift. Right. <sighs> right? Yeah. <And> complicated. <laughs> complicated. It, but when you practice this stuff, and this is what a lot of and practitioners... And recognizing it, the you, roles, yeah. You recognize it more and more and more. It comes down to, like, everyday life with me and James now. Yeah. You know, who who is this for? Like, he gives me head rubbies. And if I'm like, I don't like it, um, it's like, that's that gift's for me, though. Yeah. So if I want him to change that, how he's giving me head rubbies before bed... If I don't speak up and advocate for myself, then who is it for? Nobody's receiving right. the fucking gift. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Head rubbies. It's Head. cute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Helps me go to sleep. Um, so this leads us kind of to our last area. And we've already been talking about boundaries. But what, um, what about people who have difficulty setting boundaries due to trauma-related yeah. um, reactions? I It's... I mean, there's different exercises, you know, that we can go through. The no one is definitely one of those. Um, but it's just, it's practice and having it practiced in a safe enough 
container with somebody who's knowledgeable to help you work through that right. and I think it's just doing it again and again and again and um yeah just really practicing it in in you know that's summing it up in a very broad term but right yeah like you just mentioned safe container and I know that safe enough well, safe enough. You can never yes. make a safe container. True. You can never make somebody feel safe. And this leads into this question I have in my mind. How people, you know, accessing this help. Is there anything you want to say to anyone out there about taking that step? Because that's mm-hmm. probably the hardest step to take. It's just reaching out mm-hmm. and asking for that support. Because right now you've had volunteers that are willing Yes. Right. And it's the ones that that are maybe maybe there's shame in there. Maybe there is blocking out those traumas and not wanting to recognize them or going through that. Right. And going through those emotions and all of those feelings that come up, like how or dissociating with alcohol. Yeah. You know, having to get drunk. Yeah. So how do people make that step? Like, what would you say to them? Well, I think it's just acknowledging that and just reaching out to anybody you know, anybody who you you feel, you know, that little bit of connection or trust, like listening to this podcast, you're like, oh my God, I fucking relate to all of this. You know, just taking that plunge of reaching out and like, you know, a lot of SSEs build their practices uh, on referrals. So right. even though I, you know, you might say, you know, this is what I'm looking for, somebody to help me with gender trauma. And I'm like, you know, that's not really my wheelhouse. However, I know some really amazing people right. that I can put you in touch with and you can chat with them and see right. if this is what you're looking for. Um, referral networks are huge. So even if you just reach out to one person, you might find you reach a huge a network of people, yeah. of others, you know, and even as an SSE myself in my practice, it's not I'm not going to just be like, I'm the only person that's going to be part of your healing journey. Right. You know, there might be a Something natural might come path. Up and then all of a sudden. I'm like, yeah. here, go, go see this natural yeah. path. Get your hormones checked. You know, do it. Do the Dutch test that I did. Yeah. Um, or, you know, you need to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And together we can work on choice and voice and healing your pelvic bowl um, or, or birth trauma or whatever you're experiencing. But I think just reaching out to one person is is the first thing, biggest first step, step yeah. that you could take for yourself and in your healing journey. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna take break. A break. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna break to commercial, and when we get back, we're gonna talk IG questions, Instagram Q and A. If you're looking for some more juicy sex education topics, make sure to head over to my Instagram, Sex Ed for the Modern Bed. I share all kinds of posts about relationships, sex, intimacy, and dating, and it's all free. Head over to Instagram now and search for Sex Ed for the Modern Bed. No spaces. And hit follow today. And we are back. Last segment. This is always a fun one. Um, so for those following either this Instagram's page or my coaching page, I always ask questions related to the topic that the show is about. Um, and these are the, these are the questions that I got when I was like, what questions do you have for Tara? (laughs) So question number one, uh, you often share about your practices every day. Can you tell us about what they are, why you do them and how has the experience been, been with doing it every day? Mm. So I think this is kind of about like my morning ritual. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And also like when I do uh, communal erotic practice with people that are mostly peers, there's other people that have been involved in that too. Um, But yeah, I just do a whole range of stuff uh, and whatever feels pleasurable to me. And it's just setting a little time container for myself to just do what feels good to me in that moment. And it doesn't have to be about masturbation and touching my genitals. Sometimes it is, but not every single time. Um, Sometimes I do like a card draw. Sometimes I might be listening to music and dancing. Or doing your yoga. Doing yoga. Um, 
there are so many different things I've done in my mindful erotic practice and morning ritual. And it's just what feels good. It's just connecting to myself. And there's so much value in recognizing what my body needs every morning and nurturing that. And you you talk a lot about play, recognizing and celebrating the opportunities to play. Yeah. And um, diving into those when you can, you know, if it's once, twice a week or every day, taking a moment, right? Thinking about the puzzles. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that is sometimes not playful, (laughs) stressful. Or pleasurable. (laughs) I'm like, fuck this place. But yeah, no, it's, um, I definitely value being able to do that for myself and put that take the time yeah yeah Yeah. set aside that time to be able to do those things for yourself yeah definitely the next question we have here is is it weird being a pansexual i love my wife and want to share ourselves with a trans person Mm -mm. is it weird being a pansexual no i don't i don't maybe a different word what is it like to be a pansexual Yeah, that's how I identify. And, you know, like personally, I've just never like been like, oh, here's a gender. I only like that gender. You know, I appreciate all bodies, all different gender expressions. And for me, the connection really comes from just that person and who they are as a person. The soul part of it. Yeah, like that's what I'm like, ooh, I want to know more about this person. It's so interesting and so sexy and yeah, like they could be a woman, man, non-binary, trans. It really does not matter to me. Um, and, you know, this person obviously is married. Um, and sometimes that that can be scary, like telling your partner that you want to explore something different uh, and sharing that non-conforming part of yourself yeah, and we obviously, we don't know the context that this person is sharing. And so sharing ourselves with a trans person, maybe has it ever happened before with other people? That's some layers to navigate too, right? Whether this is a first time talking about it yeah. versus it's the first time wanting to have a trans person. Yeah, and I, you know, a little bit sticky for me. I don't like when people are fetishized, so I don't mm. know if that's what's oh, happening here yeah, yeah. too. Right. Um, you know, that's a little bit... Eh. It, it also could just be the person in, in particular is who they are. Yes. They have their eyes set on, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. I don't think... know that context. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'm like, a eh, little sticky. I don't know enough to pass judgment on that, though. But... Um, talk to them. Yeah. Talk, talk to, to your wife. <laughs> talk to your wife and see what, what she feels about that and... Yeah, there's, you know, no matter who you decide to be with, even if you have an open relationship, I think the number one thing is respect and not coercing others to do what you want, um, respecting their boundaries, their limits, you know, that whole notice, trust, value, communicate, give them that space to do that for themselves too. Yeah. Okay, question number three. What are both sexes doing wrong in the online dating world? Doing wrong. Both sexes? All people. All people. Yeah, I was just <laughs> like, mm, let's just change that. What are? What is everyone doing wrong in the online dating world? I, you know, I don't, I don't know because I haven't been in the online dating world in a long time. <laughs> Uh, but I will say that I am preparing to do an interview with somebody who is a dating expert and they offer courses and programs for people who are currently dating and she is an amazing resource and I'm really excited to interview her. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. For the answer to that question. Yeah. May have to carry that over. Yes. I can definitely, you know what, I'm going to like. I'm going to write that down. I'm just going to like get a little (laughs) star beside here. There we go. And I'll, I'll ask her. I'll ask her that question. And this last question, I feel, um, probably relates to so many people out there. How do I dare tell my wife about my sexual fantasy? <laughs> that dare right there kind of shows that it's a very scary thought this person is experiencing. I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
in class we talk about like the charmed circle and you know how inside of this circle as long as you're fitting into what (laughs) colonization and the patriarchy deems acceptable when it comes to sex you know only having one partner only doing it in your bedroom um only having like certain positions you know like then that's what's safe and that's how people are treated with more respect and dignity when they stay in those things there's no kinks there's no fetishes and more and more these days people are not wanting to conform to this charmed circle of sex and sexuality and sexual expression and so it can be a really scary thing when you're like i want to venture outside of this yeah So I think, you know, identifying that is probably your first step, which it sounds like this person has done. Um, And I think setting that container to have that conversation, like, you know, you're not going to just blurt it out, you know, when when the kids are running around and... Or you've never spoken about anything before. Yeah. You have to be sensitive to how they might receive the information. Yeah. Yeah, while yeah, still speaking your truth. That's a great point, Jessica. Yeah, definitely. Um, having a healthy sexual dialogue in place definitely helps. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you feel like that is really a challenging thing to do is setting aside a time container, uh, a, a container just for you guys to talk about sex or you people to talk about sex uh, and what you are desiring – uh, like get in touch with 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 somebody to help you kind of be like a third party in that. And I've worked with couples on this specifically, you know, like actually navigating. That. Yeah, how to navigate like different sexual fantasies or they have one specifically and it's really challenging for them to like bring it up to their partners. So sometimes having a little like a third party person involved in that, can help and if that's not accessible or not something that you're interested in um just you know you gotta be kind of honest you know this is your partner that you want to have for the rest of your life and um I think just being honest with it and and using I statements with it you know like I'm I, I notice in my body that I get a little bit turned on and excited thinking about A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. Um, would you be open to exploring this with me? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And it doesn't mean like, boom, we're going to go straight into anal or a gangbang. It can mean like, okay, like let's start off with finding some um, some porn that's that has this and just like watching this or doing some research about it together allowing your partner to possibly see how they feel yeah and and before getting into the full-blown where they they don't know how to express how they feel yeah yeah like even saying you don't have to give me an answer right away take some time to think about it and maybe we'll check do some research we'll check back and set a date together on blah 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 and then we can we can talk Talk about this a little bit more yeah I don't know how how would you handle it if you had a specific because you're in a partnership yeah um I think I I want to say I'm probably and if you're listening out there (laughs) my partner um he would probably be like we never do this but I'm learning (laughs) I think that it's some you have to create that safe space to to be able to express yourself not feel judged and know that you might not get the answer you want yeah right yeah and and be ready for that and be willing to accept that um and and respectfully have that conversation right because in order to have a partnership, you need to be able to communicate with each other. And if, you know, you keep those things held inside, you know, it's not going to do good for either. But at the same time, you also have to allow them to have that opportunity to express exactly how it might make them feel too. Mm-hmm. Because they may not be in the same boat and they'll probably want to try and, you know, appease your request, but you need to make sure that they feel safe in doing so and know that they can say no. 
Mm -hmm. right? And that's still okay because this is not necessarily theirs. It's not their um, request. It's yours. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And any feedback that you get, you know, one thing we practice with each other as peers is like, somebody's like, no, I don't want to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for telling me. Thank you for for sharing that with me. Thank you for being true to yourself. Thank you for asking for what you need. Right. You know, and acknowledging that because it's, it is, it's a very vulnerable position to be mm-hmm. in saying, yeah. hey, I want to try this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially if you're not having regular sexual dialogue together in your relationship. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. No, oh, hey. Jessica, you had some great points. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and yeah thank you so much jessica this has been such an amazing time with you i was was a little bit nervous i was nervous too (laughs) but yeah this was you know the hour flew by it's crazy yeah and thank you to all the guests all the listeners who are tuning into the show um until next time claim your pleasure own your body and stay in presence Thank you to all of my amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, get social with me. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexedforthemodernbed. for the Modern Bed.